Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Virginia Wright, and I'm the co-moderator of this Paralympian Experience Panel. I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the sacred land which we are on today. This land, which we call Mother Earth, is the territory of the Huron-Wendat First Nations, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Mississauga of Scugog Island First Nation, Haudenosaunee. The territory was subject of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We are committed to a path of truth and reconciliation that's based on partnership and respect for the many ways of learning, knowing and being. Today, Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful, honoured and humbled to have the opportunity to live and work in this city on this territory we call Turtle Island. Chi miigwech, nya awagoa, merci, thank you. And now a brief introduction to our panel discussion topic and its format. I am so pleased to be co-moderating today with Roxy O'Rourke from University of Toronto. As context for my involvement here, this session on the Parasport experience connects directly to the physical literacy research of the Spark Lab, which I lead here at, at Bloorview Research Institute, and which is supported in large part by our Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Foundation. We do this work with our research partners, Dr. Kelly Arbor and her graduate team at the University of Toronto and our community-based centers, including Variety Village, the Ability Center in Whitby and Pickering All Ability Soccer Club. The overarching goal of our team's Igniting Fitness Possibilities program of research is to establish ways to help kids with physical disabilities and special needs achieve successful participation in physical activity and a diversity of sports with family and friends. Our ultimate hope is that this focus on physical literacy, which is built on a foundation of inclusion designed to get kids into the game, will continue to grow into adulthood such that physical activity participation will remain an enjoyable and enriching lifestyle choice for whatever level or sports they may choose from recre recreational to Paralympian. And now to our session and our amazing Paralympian panelists, Danielle, Mike, and Richard. We'll start with each panelist taking four to five minutes to share some key elements of their parasport journey. In the next 15 minutes, Roxy and I will pose several questions to explore their ideas related to mentoring in sport, lifelong participation, and the way forward for families, communities, and researchers together. And then your questions will take center stage. To that end, please send your questions and comments to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen as we go along, and they'll come to Roxy and me to pitch to our panelists in the last 10 minutes of this session. Please note this session is being recorded. And now I'd like to welcome my co-moderator, Roxy, to introduce herself and our panel. Over to you, Roxy. Thank you, Virginia. Hi, everyone. My name is Roxy O'Rourke. Um, I'm a project coordinator at SickKids and a PhD student at the University of Toronto within the Faculty of Kinesiology. My research focus is within behavioral studies supervised by Dr. Kelly Arbor Nikotopoulos and Dr. Catherine Zaviston. My PhD program of research focuses on the mental health of athletes with physical disabilities. I'll be looking at the mental health impacts of overtraining within sport, specifically focusing on eating disorders within athletes with physical disabilities. Outside of my studies, I'm a long distance runner and a retired dancer turned dance teacher. I will now turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Danielle Duplessis. Thanks, Roxy and Virginia. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. I'm super excited to be here talking to you all. Um, yeah, so a bit about my journey to the Paralympics. Um, I've played sports since I was very little. So my parents um, were both athletes and coaches and my brother and I were involved in sports um, from a really young age and sort of into, um, I guess, adolescence and high school, it turned out that I was, I was getting good. Um, so I played at the provincial level in New Brunswick in soccer and basketball and volleyball. 
Um, and so starting in grade 11, I had these sort of repeat injuries. Um, so for all the PTs in the room, you'll know what the unhappy triad is. Um, so I sustained that injury to my left knee, um, which is a tear of the ACL, MCL, and meniscus. Um, and so the first time I sustained that injury was in grade 11. I had it reconstructed. Um, and then unfortunately, again, in grade 12, uh, sustained the same injury to that knee. So moving into um, my undergrad, I played a little bit of volleyball <laughs> in university, um, but ultimately, unfortunately, again, same injury um, in university. And that was sort of not so much a full stop, but like a fizzle out of my high performance, uh, able-bodied sports career. And so at that point it was getting harder, um, harder for me to do these activities of daily living. Um, so walking, walking upstairs and things like that were becoming more difficult and it was getting harder and harder, more complaints from my surgeon, I guess, about having to sort of put the knee back together. Um, and so it was, a, it was a really challenging transition because I had gotten so much out of sport and taken so much from able-bodied sport. Um, and after, you know, a little while of, of moping and kind of lamenting about my situation, I ended up reaching out to Parasport New Brunswick, um, which is our provincial parasport organization about playing a recreational wheelchair basketball. Um, and so my hope was that I could play pickup. I felt like I had this really specific skill set and kind of nowhere to use it now. Like I'd played sports for so long. I knew so much about basketball um, and I, I just wanted to do something with it. Um, and I got the most enthusiastic response back from Sabrina Durapo, who's a former wheelchair basketball Paralympian. Um, and she said, like, this is perfect. You're perfect. Um, you're actually able to play. You're classifiable. So don't worry about playing rec. You can play at a, as, as high a level as you want. Um, and so really a quick transition for me, a huge flip um, from thinking that I would just play at like the Y um, to being on the Canada Games team, um, eventually moving to Toronto to train full time at our national training center here. Um, I, since then, I've made the Pan Am Games team where we won gold in 2019. Um, and then also uh, recently was at the Tokyo Paralympics. So it's been a really beautiful transition for me. And I'm, I'm so thankful for Parasport. And this community has op like welcomed me with open arms. And I've gotten so much from it. So happy to be here and happy to share my experience today. Thanks, Danielle. Um, up next, we have Richard Peter. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, nice to come out and meet vir virtually again. Um, my name is Richard Peter, also Salah Kinam from the Coast Salish tribes here in uh, the West Coast. I'm originally from Vancouver Island, currently live in Vancouver, uh, BC. And I'm actually, my story's a little bit different than uh, Danielle's, uh, and that actually I've been in a wheelchair since I was a young child myself, and that I got injured when I was five years old. Um, got injured in a motor vehicle um, crash and then and then continued to uh, carry on with uh, my education and so on and so continued with life I guess so to say. Um, growing up in a small town on Vancouver Island in the late 70s with a disability was a bit of a challenge there was definitely some ups and downs um, living on reserve uh, so that was definitely a bit of a challenge but what uh, makes you a bit stronger, uh, is really good and beneficial. And um, so I continued to live, um, I guess, as normal as possible, going to school, playing sports with my family and friends and doing a lot of activities as much as I could. Um, I'd say I owe a lot of it to my parents and that um, mainly once I um, got my injury that my parents sort of still kicked me out the door and said, all right, Richard, still go be a kid. So I went out and did whatever I could and had a lot of fun. Um, and then actually I really didn't know much about para sports. I was just happy doing what I was doing, playing with my family and friends. Um, we adapted a lot of sports on our own, um, that I could still participate with my, my friends. Um, but then actually finally a, a wheelchair basketball dem demo team came to my school when I was in uh, high school. And it was definitely the first time that I'd ever seen wheelchair sports and, Actually, I, I didn't want to go at that time, but luckily I was dragged out to it to go check it out. And, and as I say, that's opened many doors for me in that uh, uh, getting to meet, well, other similar athletes that were 
in my similar situation, new peers, new friends for life. And, and so that was definitely a great opportunity for me to get out and, and learn more about parasports. Um, as I mentioned, that opened many doors. I tried as many sports as I could from track and field to tennis to racquetball to what else did I try? You know, uh, basketball and, and I eventually uh, was directed towards basketball because I really enjoyed team sports. Um, so that's where that sort of launched my career into sport, I guess. And, and I really had a good time with that. So I've represented basketball um, on the men's team. I've actually been to five Paralympic games and come back with three gold and one silver throughout my career and retired after 2012. Um, but mainly I always say I'm a sport for life kind of a guy. So I continue with many different activities with from riding a hand bike to trying different sports. And then somebody gave me a call to get out and try some uh, wheelchair badminton, a uh, pair of badminton. And so I went out and tried to help drum up some interest and then also give it a try. And then I ended up um, getting selected for the national team for badminton also. And so currently I am playing a uh, pair of badminton on the national team level as a very veteran player, I would say. So it was nice to meet everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. And last but not least, we have Mike Whitehead. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, appreciate uh, appreciate the attendance and and already some great shares. Uh, I like how Richard said, and I played a little basketball. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for having me. I my injury came at uh, 24 years old. Uh, I grew up in Harrow, Ontario, um, not far from from Windsor, Ontario, by Lake Erie, small community, um, and had a really strong sports background within uh, our town. I was very fortunate and had some great coaches as a kid and uh, through high school. So I fell in love with sport um, and at a young age and just had uh, great mentors and a lot of guidance and that kind of has followed a theme in my life. Um, so at 24, um, I was apprenticing to be an electrician and uh, ended up having a, a car accident and left me with a spinal cord injury. Um, so after my spinal cord injury to uh, C6-7, since there's some, some medical folks here, we'll know that C6-7, so um, while I was in spinal cord injury, a local wheelchair rugby team came uh, in London, Ontario at Parkwood Hospital. A couple of the guys and girls came up to the hospital and, uh, you know, they just shared with me that things are going to be OK. And, you know, I just I couldn't I couldn't believe that they were getting in and out of cars and and they invited, invited me to wheelchair rugby. Uh, so on a Tuesday night, um, a fella who's now on the national team. Uh, one of the national team coaches picked me up and, uh, you know, became a mentor of mine and brought me to my first practice. And, uh, you know, I got into the gymnasium and I saw people in chairs, you know, running into each other and making all kinds of noise and having fun and smiling. And I knew at that point, you know, this is a really cool sport and life was going to be uh, okay. Um, and so I started to, uh, you know, I fell in love with it. I had a community, um, I made some friends. I saw that, uh, you know, life in a chair is gonna be all right. Actually, it's gonna, it turned out to be great, uh, you know, better than my imagination. So I started to put some work in as far as training and, and learning the sport, uh, came to play for a team in the States to get, uh, kind of cut my teeth. And um, yeah, started on that journey and fortunately made the, the national team. Um, and yeah, we hit a few Paralympics along the way, a few medals, um, not, not, not as shiny as Bears, but as Richards, but uh, that's okay. That's all right. It's been an amazing, amazing journey for me. Um, it's, led, it's led me in so many different directions. It's opened up so many opportunities. Um, and, and now I'm starting to coach a little bit and, and I just continue to go back to that first practice for me where I found a community and um, I found some social health, some emotional health, some physical health, just by getting back into a gymnasium and uh, participating. And when I, um, you know, when I didn't come to practice, 
the coach would call me and, and ask, you know, where are you? And that's kind of, you know, I kind of stick to that philosophy now when I'm, I'm coaching and, and helping out others is, uh, you know, it's all about community. So I'm just, yeah, I'm really thankful to be here and, uh, and I look forward to uh, what's next. That's great. Thank you very much, Mike, for, uh, for that and for all three of you for sharing your experiences. We're hearing so much about mentoring and we're hearing so much about sort of paying it forward and community and, uh, and also for me, a lot's resonating around the physical literacy piece, right, around the, the opportunity to try different sports with different people and kind of find out what you're good at, what you want to try. So lots of, lots of things resonating there. We're going to get more into ideas of role models participation in a few minutes but I think the first question is just to look a little bit at the technology and just ask you about the role that technology um, has has actually played in in either helping you access sport or perform at an even higher level in sport you or your teammates um, or preventing injury as well so maybe Richard will start with you just because you sort of started the earliest on in uh, in sport and so I have a you know a, a real diversity of experience right from the beginning. Yes, yeah, definitely for me and that I've uh, I guess sort of had the longest career in this in this area. Um, but yeah i've definitely seen the evolution, even just of sports chairs. Um, you know from all the difference let's say camber if anybody knows what camber is but it's when the wheels are sort of bent sideways and so from that, from using seat belts and straps to stay into your chair and then from anti-tips so that you don't tip over, like that was all brand new. Like we never had that when I first started. I remember when, as Mike talked about, when you get out and practice and play and you bang into one another. And when I first started that we would bang in and eventually I would fall out of my chair. And, and so you really had to learn how to get back into your chair. And that was sport. And so that was definitely um, also that you had to learn how to be strong enough and, and the challenge of um, learning to, you know, go with the flow or, or that sport and, and still to continue on and play. And, and so that was definitely a bit of the challenge. And so even for my first wheelchair of when I got hurt back in the 70s, that that was an old ENJ. That's um, I'd say that chair was probably closer to 40 to 45 pounds. Whereas the chair, my everyday chair in, I'm in right now is probably under 10 pounds. And so that definitely makes a huge difference. And so there's just so many more different options um, with sports chair to everyday chair and, and just making things a lot more easier. And, and it's a really joy, even I'd say with my work right now, we're working with, uh, within spinal cord research and finding out new equipment. And, and that's always the joy of seeing that there's so many more options now and, and just thinking of the future that there's always trying to find even a better solution for how to make that chair as light as possible or you know working on your bladders and bowels and just a bit of everything so technology is definitely um, there's a huge leap that's going on and so that's also pretty awesome to be part of that and and it's pretty wild to see the changes too I mean sometimes it is hard trying to teach an old dog new tricks but we learn a few things <laughs> so it's been a joy. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Danielle. Any thoughts from you coming into it at a different angle and coming in from an injury standpoint as well? I mean, what did you sort of meet up with with equipment and what do you see in terms of advances that are helpful for the sport? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm a lot more fresh than Richard. So my my span is more like four or five years. Um, but just thinking from the start, so from my first chair that I played in, which was an adjustable um, quickie like club sports chair. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of start off in those, you can change the width, you can change all sorts of things on it. And so you can try to figure out sort of what works best for you. Um, and so I showed up, yeah, at the National Training Center to play with the senior women's team in my adjustable chair. Um, and it became pretty obvious. I think Mike's laughing because there's a ceiling, right? That that equipment, it's it's great at a rec level, um, but there is a ceiling to sort of how hard you can push that chair, how fast you can go, how heavy the chair is, like Richard mentioned, when everything's adjustable. Um, and so looking into Pan Am Games, um, it was really important to me, you know, to have a rigid chair so that it wasn't going to break so that I could move a little faster and stuff like that. Um, those are expensive. Those are like they take a lot of time to figure out what you want. 
um, and going into Pan Ams, I ended up borrowing a chair from Pat Anderson, who's a great wheelchair basketball player, um, the best wheelchair basketball player in the world right now. Yeah, he's all right, um, so it's fair. Um, but uh, the, the thing about that is that Pat and I have very different disabilities. So Pat's a double amp. He's also, you know, a lot, a lot broader in the shoulders. We have the same width of hips, so I could fit in his chair, but it was like by no means optimized. Um, and so that was my first rigid frame was this one that I borrowed from Pat. I added a foot plate to it. Pat doesn't have feet, so I had to throw that on, um, but not optimized at all. And so since then, it's been this game of like, like little adjustments now, right? So trying to figure out how, um, how I can stop having a ceiling from the equipment, like how I can push myself and not be limited. Um, and so super fortunate to have, you know, new, light, fast chairs, lots of carbon um, and, and stuff like that just to help. Um, yeah. So the limit right now is my strength and my speed and not and not my equipment, which is a great feeling. Um, yeah. So I think we've come a long way and I think that there's a lot of innovation in this area and a lot of interest. So I'm excited to see just how far it can go. And does anyone have any comment amongst the three of you as to where you think the innovation needs to go next? And even thinking about kids starting into the sport with what we've got now for kids to get going um, or at the elite level, any thoughts on that? This is your chance to get out there and say, okay, let's really improve whatever because um, might be able to do it. Uh, might. If I may, um, I think one thing that's kind of cool with us so with um, the, you know, a C-spine injury, a lot of the guys are limited between um, hand function and core function. And we've made some adjustments over the years. Um, I couldn't agree more as far as chair development, you know, they keep getting lighter and stronger and fit better, but with limited hand function, the, the use of different types of gloves or pine tar or rubber on the hands to, um, to propel has, it, it keeps evolving, which is great. And then also, you know, there's some, some guys with limited trunk function. So, getting chair seating positions that are optimized or even adding a, instead of just a stability belt, a hard shell yeah. around the trunk. Um, and you can, we do a lot of time trials that are, are um, we, do, we do time trials every time we're together and you can see people improving in speed and agility and turning just through adding a, a like kind of fake core, a fake trunk just by uh, some technology and some 3D printing. So. Oh. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cool to see that progression. So I'm sure it's just going to keep taking off. Great. That's great. Okay. Maybe we'll move from the physical now and we'll go over Actually, to Virginia. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I wanted to yeah add two cents, especially just because with the, the crowd that we have with, um, people in the medical field and the therapists, um, cause even all of us have talked about your peers and I think all of us have learned from previous coaches, previous friends. Um, Daniel just talked about equipment wise and chairs too. And, and so we learn a lot from one another. I mean, yes, we've learned a lot from the therapists and the medical staff that we've had in our lives and careers, but also, you know, my first practice, I'm like, wow, you can see what, as Mike talked about, you, you see what everybody else is doing and you're like, okay, I can still do that. So that's, um, and then equipment wise, we've learned a lot from our friends that we're like, all right, here, try this new chair, try this new strap. And, and so it is also just learning more about our disability and what mainly what our functions are, what we can and cannot do. And then sometimes when you see somebody else do it that has a similar injury, you go, okay, yes, maybe I can do that. Let me give it a try. And so it's also listening to one another and our peers. So I think we learn a lot from one another also. Right. That's great. Thanks. And I think us as researchers and clinicians, again, as part of that community to be really part of that and listening to that as well to figure out, you know, what you've learned and what we can move forward with. Thank you. Okay. I think maybe we'll move over then. Roxy, I think you've got a question that's on a different side of things. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, it's kind of a two-pronged question, um, but first off, if you could kind of elaborate and talk a little bit about who your role models were throughout your sport experience and um, growing up. And then secondly, just talking a little bit about your experience in sports growing up specific to your body. So um, what role the body played within your sport experience and kind of your awareness of your body within sport. Um, so I guess starting with perhaps Mike. Um, role model and, and body and sport. Um, for me, 
you know, sport was everything. Um, and so right away as a kid being competitive, um, and, that, and that's continued in my life, that, that competitive nature where, um, you know, I was very fortunate at a young age to have guys and girls that were older than me that had, uh, you know, at first I could see the fancy skills they had. They could either, you know, dunk a ball or, you know, they just, so I was fortunate where they would take me under their wing and teach me the tricks and then guide me down the right path as far as, um, you know, a good friend of mine says, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. And, and anytime I was hanging out with um, people in sport that were going down the right path, I just, they were mentors of mine and I was very fortunate to follow some great people. And, um, and that continues to be the case, um, you know, but as I, as I'm getting a few years, you know, I'm starting to look up, you know, we have two great captains on our team that are, that are younger than me. And I, I, I adore them. I look up to them. So it's interesting. My role models uh, are not always older now. Um, still the case, but I have some young guys on the team that are just great, great dudes. So I'm really lucky that way. And I continue to, you know, I see them push hard and achieve great things on and off the court. And yeah, that's what sport has done for me, you know, and it started at like six, seven, eight years old. And, you know, I'm in my forties and, and this continues to be the theme. Um, and then with body image, uh, it's really interesting, you know, that, um, because I'm competitive and I love sport, that leads to, well, you know, good eating. And, and that hasn't always been the case for me. You know, I've had, I've had different times in my life where I weighed different weights and in, but again, it's just this trajectory, right? So it's kind of, um, as far as training and fitness and body image, it wasn't always like, wow, I'm, I'm buffer, you know, I'm super fit. It was, it's taken a lot of work, but for me, it's that journey. And, um, it's always built my, my confidence in myself when, um, I know that if I put some work in and continue to educate myself and, and eat correctly, um, I see some gains. So, uh, yeah, those two things are important to me. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, Richard, do you want to build on that? Yeah, for me, um, I think it was great in that I, like I said, I, I reluctantly came out and tried a pair of sports when I was younger. And and so those a couple of those players that came out to introduce sport to me were definitely a few of my role models that um, I learned from right away and, and definitely had many questions as I was a teenager with an SCI. And so just sort of getting into the parasport world, then I just had many questions of how to travel, how to play sports, you know, what kind of equipment do you have? And, and so there's definitely loads of questions. And even as an older, well, as a, as a young male, there's definitely um, many questions that I had from the rest of my peers. And, and so that was definitely a lot, of, a big joy um, for me to learn. So that was a great opportunity. And then even just to add more with, with, with body image and, and also I would just say equipment image too. And that's um, just to get in the right piece of equipment, I guess directed towards a lot of the therapists too. And just saying, yes, there's some equipment that you've learned about that says right here, this is what it should be good by, by the book. But then also think about each person um, and their limitations and, and well, also what they, they do. Like my early chairs when I was younger because I was a very active kid even from, let's say, well, maybe I don't want to say it, but with side guards, I would take those off of my chair because they sort of got in my way as I was a kid. And I'm like, no, I want to go fast. I want to get out there and do stuff. I want to be a kid. And so that's where I would sort of tear down my chair and make it as light as possible. And, and so that's what I've continued to do now that I'll always find what's good for me and what is good for this time. Um, so that's what's always good to see. Um, also, what just what all the different technology that's out there and find out what's best for for my activity that I'm doing so that's always uh, one of the different benefits and I always maybe I always just come back to peers and that's always you know I always learn about different stuff but then also with different seating symposiums and and find out the new technology that's coming around the corner so it's always good to sometimes find out what's happening so sometimes either if you don't have that opportunity then find somebody else that does know a bit more of that knowledge too and, and see what's out there. Thanks for that. Um, Danielle, do you have anything you want to briefly add to that? 
Yeah, so I think I'll add to the um, body image piece first. As someone who was kind of continually or like chronically injured um, in high school and in university, it was it was really a challenging time. I spent a lot of time on the sidelines, um, like sort of waiting to get back into sport, watching my friends play able-bodied sports. Um, and there was like a real feeling of like deficiency, like disappointment in my leg that it just couldn't do what I wanted it to do. Like it wasn't good enough. Um, and so it was just so refreshing to jump into para sport and to all of a sudden not have that limitation. Um, when I'm playing wheelchair basketball, it doesn't even cross my mind. Um, like my leg is, is so not a part of of the picture, not a part of, of who I am as an athlete in, in para sport. Um, and so that's been a really, a really great transition for me. And to see two people with um, lots of different abilities, lots of different body types, but lots of competence and lots of confidence um, has been has been really a great transition. So from sort of comparing myself to other able-bodied athletes um, to feeling at home among para athletes, I think has been really um, yeah, really helpful for me. And then Roxy to the to the role model question. Um, I think, and Mike and Richard both know uh, Mike Frogley, um, but he has been a huge, a huge influence in my sports career and, and really champions this idea that like you're more than an athlete, you're, a, you're a whole entire person. Um, and I feel really fortunate to have interacted with coaches that foster development outside of sport within sport, obviously, but also outside of sport. Um, and encourage their athletes to sort of stretch themselves personally, academically. Um, and so, yeah, without his encouragement, I might not have ended up at U of T or had help sort of managing uh, a master's degree or working um, out of the BRI with Shannon and Elaine. Um, and yeah, I feel, I feel super fortunate to have had him as a role model and to have had him sort of on my side, pushing me to, you know, further my education while playing basketball. Um, so yeah, he's been really been a great influence on me. Thank you all for that. And um, specifically, Richard, the term equipment image, I've never actually heard someone explicitly use that term before. So thank you for that. Um, and I'll pass it over to Virginia for one final question before the Q&A. All right, great, thank you. Well, let's just uh, go to something that I think you've all alluded to actually, is that we know that very few athletes will become elite Paralympians. I mean, it's a huge journey and you've each talked about the importance of sport in your life just for so many other reasons. I mean, social health benefits, self-image, all, all sorts of happiness, all of these things. So a bit of a grassroots question, what role do you think a pediatric rehab center like Holland Bloorview and our partners have in getting kids and families started or keep them going on a, on a path to physical activity and sport? So actually maybe we'll, uh, we'll, go, we'll go to you, Mike, to start on this one. All right. Um... I think what worked for me, um, my experience at the hospital was the physios, the OTs, the nursing staff, they had the phone numbers of the local team. And so, you know, basically unbeknownst to me, I was like these random people in chairs are showing up. Nobody told me that they called them, you know, they just kind of came by and, and I do that now for, for others. Like I, still continue to, um, when somebody's newly injured, um, local hospital, local PTs, OTs, or in the community, because we're kind of a small community, you know, give me a call or the local team. And we just kind of follow up like that. So that was huge, that, that connection out to the community so I could see people like me. And then the follow-up, um, you know, there were a few amazing nurses that I had when I, you know, I, left the hospital, got an apartment, you know, there were still a few great people with wonderful hearts that just would check in, hey, you know, how are you? So I think those two things were huge. The, the community, the direct phone call, hey, come say hi to this, this fella. And then um, the follow up after, you know, a few months later, it was like, hey, you know, how's it going? Are you, uh, are you enjoying rugby? And then basically, I'm doing the same thing for, for the locals here. So that's what's worked for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Richard, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, definitely, of course. Um, 
especially within rehab. I mean, I'm a, even a slightly different story too in that I got injured from uh, Vancouver Island and came to Vancouver for, for rehab when I was five years old, but then went back to my home community. So that's probably also why I didn't hear much about parasport and other opportunities and that went back to my community and wasn't in sort of in direct contact with a lot of the different programs until finally um, the sport groups heard of this young kid that was up in in Duncan me and so they came up and did the the basketball demo and so I think that really helped like I, I always say uh, open the door and and then also back to what Mike was talking about that year I was giving back to the community also and so that's what I've always tried to do also is try to get out there and and give back to anybody else now um, that has just started or even just gone through rehab here in Vancouver with GF Strong that you know whenever somebody calls whether it's a uh, uh, psychologist or a therapist or SCIBC if they give a call and say hey Richard there's somebody that you should come down and chat with him and so I think having a presence within the rehab setting is, is huge um, also because you know you can learn a few things well you can learn many things from different therapists but then also just to see it another person with the same disability like when I first got injured I'm like I can't get up from the floor under my wheelchair but then until you see somebody else do it I'm like oh Yes, I can. So I think, you know, that really does help to have that interaction in from like jumping a curb or learning to drive or transfer in and out of your car. Um, so definitely there's a lot of ways to uh, uh, share and learn from from peers and and um, whether it's in the rehab center or just in, in regular life too and, and everyday life. So yeah, so it, it, it sounds like having programs that are both linked within and outside of the rehab center. And again, the mentors, the role models, the, the community that's aware and that can support. This is so critical. Um, Danielle, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think from like an actionable perspective within Bloorview, um, it would be great to see there are a lot of talented para athletes in Ontario, um, in in you know Canada in general, and it would be great to have a network of mentors. You can connect people with similar experiences, similar disabilities, um, and sort of foster foster enthusiasm for sport that way. Um, I think also understanding that sport is a spectrum and sort of the minority of the minority benefit from the Paralympics, um, but you don't have to perform at the Paralympics um, to benefit from sport. So having different levels, different places for people to play um, where they feel comfortable, where they are having fun, especially for kids, I think is, is one of the most important parts because I there is a high dropout rate in youth para sport. Um, I like lots of people come try and don't stick around. And so it's important to make sure that it's the programming is appropriate, the level is appropriate. Um, and then people feel connected and feel welcome. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for what's going on at, at Florby with our recreation therapists. And I, I know you guys have, have great referral pathways, but also establishing, um, establishing mentorships, I think can be really powerful in, in making people feel connected to their, their community of, of disability. Right, thank you, Danielle, for that, great. Roxy, did you want to um, move ahead with, I think the questions now, we've got several that have come up. Yeah, I think there was one question at the start um, just about overtraining and um, if any of you had heard about overtraining and if so, in what context? Sure, I can give this a tackle. Um, mainly, I actually have always, you know, sort of self monitored that on my own, which is unfortunate to my coaches. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we've, you know, as usual, when you're going to a major event, you always want to train as much as possible. But then I would also say, hold on here, I, I've got to give my body a rest too. I mean, that's definitely di a bit different in the SCI community in that if I'm going to play wheelchair basketball or rugby or whatever sport that we're, we're doing that, because I use my arms and upper body for everyday living of wheeling around and then then also the same parts of the body into my sport, then that gets very tiring <laughs> to my arms and shoulders and, and so on and all the different areas. And so it's, that's also where I'm like, all right, I need my body to rest also. Uh, if you went to a, a weightlifter or bodybuilder and they would do train different parts of the body. And so that's where I'm like, all right, we're just focusing on a few, uh, parts of the body and so that's where that makes a huge difference and I, I think I noticed that at a young age that I needed time to rest and 
recover, but even also just with, um, let's say pressure injuries and, you know, different other scenarios that can arise too. If I'm playing in my sports chair, that sometimes because I'm doing different movements than on my everyday chair, that there might be, you know, a small injury that might come up, arise just from jumping in different chairs. Um, and so that's also the danger that we've always got to look out for too. If there's an issue, we've got to uh, keep an eye out for all the different, well, I guess the, the dangerous areas that an issue might arise. So we've got to keep our eye on those also. Yeah, um, I'll also uh, take a shot at this question. I think for, for me at this point, it's a question of the quality of training over the quantity of training. Um, and so especially in trying to balance, you know, commitments to school, commitments to basketball, um, lifting weights, and also like enjoying um, being active outside of the gym, um, really having higher quality sessions um, like really intense, really focused, purposeful sessions, as opposed to having, um, you know, a lot of, of sort of shallow sessions, I think has made a big difference for me. Um, and also working with our, our sort of physiologists and our, our support team to monitor our training load and kind of bump up or bump down the practices according to that load was really important moving into the Paralympics. Um, and when you're trying to perform at a high level, you wanna make sure that you're peaking at the right time for competition. Um, and so this idea of overtraining was I think on all of our minds, especially this summer, because we couldn't play any games. So we were like practicing, practicing, practicing so much. Um, and yeah, it was really important for us to monitor how our bodies are feeling, how we're feeling energy wise, um, and then sort of moderate the training to match that so that by the time we got to the Paralympics, you know, we still had our arms, like Richard said, but we also still had our brains, like we were still engaged and ready to play. Um, yeah, and so we're thankful to have a really good team around us um, who can help us make those sort of more tailored training plans instead of this earlier idea, which was just like maximum effort all the time. Um, really, I think it's important to sort of scale it based on um, where you're at. Right. We had a, a quick question from someone about where you buy your equipment from. So maybe if some one of you can just quickly tackle that and then I see it's almost time to wrap up. So any comments on I know, Mike, I mean, I can imagine the chairs that you've got just watching the videos of the rugby, the, the wheelchair rugby incredible. So Sure. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, the internet's amazing. So I, I know like in Toronto, uh, Bespoke 49 and in Canada, this is a great group of people and uh, they do some great work there. Um, and then, yeah, with the rugby chairs, you know, um, a lot of our chairs are either made in, in San Diego, there's a company or in New Zealand and, you know, you just hop online. And they, yeah. Yeah. You make a few calls, a few emails. Um, so yeah, it's it's amazing, and and a lot of times the local clubs. Mm -hmm. Once I got tapped into the community and in the local club, you know they let me know where to go for sporting equipment and uh, you know, urinary supplies and where to get my, you know, the ramp in my van. So uh, I guess it kind of, for me, linked back to um, the the community and my mentors. They were the ones that were helping me with equipment, and where to go, and it definitely saved me some money. Right. You have to be completely resourceful. And I know if we were to talk about barriers, which we don't, you know, we've gone into it, but not in specifics, um, it would probably come up as something that's a real barrier and, and trying to find ways to fund that and support that. Well, I'm looking at, I don't see anything else as far as other questions. So in the uh, interest of time, because it's almost time to move on to the research poster session and the partnership uh, showcase, which is starting shortly, I'll just wrap up and say a huge thank you to Danielle and Richard and Mike for joining us and sharing your experiences and ideas. This has been so inspirational. I think there's a lot of us to reflect on from your journeys that each of you have talked about and sit back and think about it a little 
think about the amazing advances and opportunities that are available for sports participation, but also the challenges and barriers that still exist that need to be addressed. And we didn't spend very much time on them. We heard the very positive side of things, but I think we need to also be very conscious of that. And um, maybe the role of each of us might play in being able to move forward in these opportunities for change, whether it be through someone helping our family or in our circle of friends, as we've heard a lot about already, to find a new physical activity or sport opportunity or the grassroots level of supporting inclusive sport involvement in the community as a research or a technology developer or a policymaker or a funding. Um, this is for sure a team endeavor and I think we've got, a, got all um, uh, an exciting and meaningful part to play. I, I would suggest that the audience go back and take a look again at the biographies of each of our uh, Paralympians and uh, there's lots of information there and, and I think you could probably find other things on them on the internet in terms of interviews and, uh, and be able to, uh, you know, pursue conversations further if you're interested in doing that with them. So uh, thank you as well, Roxy and Sulan for all of your part in, in making this session possible. It's been great working with you.